an English translation, and it's only published in Great Britain, I think, of Adorno's Prisms, which are uh, essays on cultural criticism, his, uh, an essay on cultural criticism itself as a method, uh, essays on um, various uh, literary texts, but also some social science texts on Veblen. There's an important essay. Uh, there's another one on Brave New World, and finally on Kafka and, um, and Schoenberg and, and others. And I think perhaps uh, next uh, in the future, either in the first session or when we get to tell Kel, it would be appropriate to juxtapose those, uh, that Adorno's uh, practical criticism, that is his, um, uh, his, his uh, these, these examples of his precise readings of texts with the kinds of theories we're finding, uh, we'll, we'll talk about today in, uh, in Dialectic of Enlightenment. Um, I think uh, I, then, uh, too, um, last time I used some of, the, uh, some of the themes in here without really identifying them in the, the kind of sketch I gave you of a, of a theory of rationalization. Um, so some of those things will, again, will be familiar to you uh, again in a slightly different context uh, uh, today. Um, the one thing that I omitted to, to say uh, last time, I mentioned it then Friday morning, but it might have made my remarks a little incomprehensible about the usefulness of the analog and digital d distinction. I want to I remind you of that, those of you that heard it Friday morning, uh, because, uh, or tell it to you for the first time, those who weren't there, uh, because um, I think it has some bearing on the, on uh, something else we'll, we'll be saying about Adorno and Horkheimer today. The, the, my main point in, in um, alluding to that particular distinction and that set of terms from, um, from information theory uh, was, that it was that it offers an interesting distinction between types of distinctions. And uh, in Wilden's, um, Wilden's presentation of this in System and Structure, again an essay, it's called Analog and Digital, which is on our reserve, uh, he makes the point, his, in his terminology, well, unless I get it mixed up, uh, I think uh, he, has a, he has two words, one is difference and the other is distinction. Now, I'm not sure which is which, but I guess it's appropriate when you're talking about difference and distinction that one can't. Exactly. So I'll, I'll call uh, the, 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 the analog way of dealing with difference, difference, and the digital one, distinction. It's probably exactly the opposite from his usage. But my point is to, 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 uh, to make the, the um, to, to show you how in each of these types of thought or language, uh, how these things can, will, will take a different form. The point about difference in, in the analog world uh, and that's also um, uh, the world of the Lacanian uh, imaginary in large part of the Freudian unconscious or dreams which don't have a negative, which don't know the subject, which don't know, uh, which don't know grammar and so forth, which don't know uh, linguistic forms of, of, uh, of grammar. In the analog world, um, difference only exists between positive terms. That is, everything is, is a positive term in the, um, in the world of the unconscious or, uh, or f in animal languages or whatever. So the difference is between two terms, each of which has an existence. Uh, now, so for example, uh, work and play. And each of these things is a separate activity a complete activity uh, which is sort of, uh, which has its own uh, inner logic and which uh, one merely juxtaposes side by side as dreams do. Now in digital languages which were, uh, uh, which um, um, in involved also the development of the negative, of zero and of the subject, uh, in digital languages suddenly that mode of conceiving difference as two separate uh, entities disappears and is replaced by what the, what the communications people call an off-on system. That is now all you'll have will be one positive term and its negative. 
So you'll have a presence and an absence rather than two presences. So now work and play will be work and not work simply, and the whole, the whole content of play will be uh, evacuated. So, so in this Kremas model that we'll come back to tomorrow, uh, that's represented by, uh, at least the way I use this, by a kind of uh, a, a real uh, opposition uh, on this top uh, line here, which I think in, in, uh, logical, in logical terms is called a contrary. That is, we have the thing, and then we have another thing which is felt to be its opposite. So black and white uh, are two existing entities which are conventionally thought to be opposites. Then this line uh, is a contradictory. That is to say, we have the thing and merely everything which is not that thing. So instead of having black and white, we have black and everything which is not black, which includes lots of other things besides white. Uh, so uh, I, as, uh, uh, that was my that was my um, uh, my purpose in um, in uh, um, presenting that 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 um, that distinction. And I think you'll see a little more. Uh, the relevance of this to, uh, to, the, to the dialectic of enlightenment when they come to talk about self-preservation and, and, uh, and the role that that plays in, in uh, modern society. And uh, to make a final note on my use of this, I see this as a, I read this in, in a, in, as a historical paradigm, that is, uh, which is not at all, I think, what information theory, what Wilden wants to do or, or what would be the appropriate, the, 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 the pertinent use of this in information theory, but it seems to me that behind that there's also a kind of buried historical paradigm of the type once upon a time there was analog, an analog world, whether that's the world of childhood, of animal life, primitive man or whatever, and now there's a digital world. And the digital world is a fall. That is, uh, it's, as you, even as you read Wilden, who has no, no interest at all in, in, in historicizing this, you feel that the description is the description of a fall from one type of existence into, into another. At any rate, that's, uh, uh, that is the interest of the distinction for me. Now, uh, I thought I would begin uh, dealing with this text today by, um, by glossing a few, um, a few sections of it. I think I may have said, but it was so long ago that probably, uh, and probably didn't mean anything then, and, uh, and I think since some of you will have been reading this and, and may find, it, find more useful a, an account of what is specifically difficult about the reading of a text like this, which is, whose difficulty is quite <coughs> different or distinct, don't know which, from uh, either uh, the Foucault text or, or that of Derrida that we'll be looking at uh, next, uh, next year. Um, uh, it seems to me that what makes up the specificity of this language and what this does is that we have two impulses going at once. That is, the one is the creation of a historical paradigm. Uh, I don't like to call that a myth, uh, but I suppose if you have to, you could call it that too. That is, uh, the, the Adorno and Horkheimer and the other people who worked on this book, because I think it's a collective book, um, are over and over again telling us a historical story. Uh, and indeed, they're telling us nothing but that. And every page is the narrative of the story, uh, either uh, overtly or, co or covertly. Uh, and, uh, and it's the same story. So the same narrative is being given to us over and over again. We'll see shortly what that is, but it's already in the title, The Dialectic of Enlightenment. Enlightenment means progress, conquest of reason over superstition and so on. But this, uh, this historical trajectory uh, is not what we would think. That is, there's a dialectic of this trajectory which makes it into something other than linear progress. Uh, this is going to be the story that they tell. On the other hand, the mode of telling of it, uh, we saw that in Foucault, uh, constructing a historical paradigm could be a very complicated business and one that is not so easily, uh, easily done as any of us might, um, might think. That is, it would, we would think that storytelling is one of the activities that's the most natural and fundamental. And if you want to tell a historical story, uh, you begin with uh, once upon a time it was like this and now it's like that. And, and, uh, uh, and that's, easy to, uh, that's easy enough to, uh, to put into words. Uh, in in um, the Foucault Prisons book, we saw that, uh, on the contrary, uh, even to, to construct a, a historical paradigm of that kind, uh, 
under certain circumstances can, re can require a great deal of indirection of really what is essentially an aesthetic t type that is, uh, it involves problems in narrative, in uh, uh, t uh, a kind, almost narrative techniques and, and, um, and all kinds of, um, uh, and all kinds of things which are, um, which are indirect and not direct. Now, um, uh, here, however, uh, the impulse to create a historical narrative uh, is tugged in a very different direction from anything we found in Foucault. Namely, it's pulled in the direction, I think, of the aphorism. And in German, uh, it seems to me that uh, the aphorism, the source of the aphorism and the source of this tradition is Nietzsche. And, and so uh, the, the language of the Frankfurt School, their very conception of, uh, uh, of uh, what it means to have successfully completed a speech act about this, about this historical narrative they want to tell, uh, what kind of sentences uh, it is the most satisfying to write then, in other words. Uh, their conception of that is, it seems to me, very strongly dominated by an aphoristic impulse. So what's going to happen then is that this language has a, one tendency, which is to, to, to create a kind of total history in which everything will be uh, poured and, and will become finally a part of this total history, and another impulse, which is to tell, uh, to tell it all at once in a single sentence. And so what will happen is that uh, on an ideal page here, this historical, uh, this historical paradigm will be repeated over and over again in every sentence. And each sentence and the whole text will break down into a series of separate, um, uh, into a series of separate uh, aphorisms. So that demands a kind of reading, I think, that's very, that can be very exasperating if we come to it from some other, from some other habit or from some other uh, uh, aesthetic or if we're not used to it. And I think um, uh, it accounts for much in this text which, is, uh, which seems obscure. That is the way uh, you, get, you get to some point in the argument and then suddenly that point is abandoned. The whole thing begins from zero, as it were, and, and uh, there doesn't seem to be the effort to... Um, uh, to, to make uh, um, s syntheses or, 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 or summaries of the type that, that, uh, that, that one finds in Foucault or uh, in a different kind of way in Derrida. So it's a thought which is somehow at, at right angles to itself at all points. That is, uh, there's a, it has a kind of life in, the, as Benjamin would say, it has a, there's a kind of perpetual present of this style which is, uh, into which it seeps, seeks to es escape through this uh, through the practice of the aphorism, at the same time that obviously it's dominated by another kind of time, which is constructing an argument that lasts for 30 or 40 pages and which goes somewhere and uh, in which allows us to know more at the end or, or to understand more than, than at the beginning. Now, I, I thought, therefore, this being the case, um, that it would be useful to uh, look at a few of these aphorisms and by glossing them uh, to get an idea of the way this thought works and also the way uh, and also the argument um, of the book. So I'll just go through and read uh, read some of these um, some of these some of the sentences which seem more self-sufficient uh, than uh, than others. So for example, on page 32, if you have this, uh, if you have the, the text. Um, these are not all, all perfect aphorisms, but I think they, uh, they do the job. Uh, he's talking about the essence of, of, um, of enlightenment, uh, and, uh, or they, rather, uh, and they say this, men have always had to choose between their subjection to nature or the subjection of nature to the self. Now, in a way, this is the whole uh, starting point of the dialectic of enlightenment. That is, it's the starting point not of the dialectic, but of enlightenment itself. I think I said the other day that um, the, the theory of, um, if not human nature, then at least historical motivation that underlies this text is, uh, is very fundamentally that of the fear of nature, the fear of being overwhelmed by nature. And therefore, uh, the reaction to that fear, which is an attempt as much to master nature as the fear of nature, and thus uh, uh, an attempt which gradually leads to uh, technical and technological mastery over the outside world. 
So uh, already in this, in this aphorism, uh, you see looming the, the fate of this, uh, of this impulse. Uh, if you don't choose subjection to nature, then you have to, on the other hand, subject nature to the self. And so there comes into being a whole logic of, of the domination uh, of nature. And indeed, this whole part of the Frankfurt School's work is um, dealt with in an important book by William Lees called The Domination uh, of Nature. We'll come back to this, uh, this part of, how can I say, the politics of the Frankfurt School, um, which leads directly, as you can imagine, into ecology, among other things, you see. And hence, Today, all of a sudden, this, uh, this part of their work seems, um, and of and Marcuse's work that builds on it, seems very, very new. Uh, page 54. In class history, this is, is a, similar, um, a similar reflection. In class history, the enmity of the self to sacrifice implied a sacrifice of the self inasmuch as it was paid for by a denial of nature in man for the sake of domination over non-human nature and over other men. So that there is, besides this, uh, the matter of subjecting nature to domination, the very coming into being of domination itself uh, becomes something that then knows its own laws and then becomes our way of living with other people. So uh, out of the domination of nature, out of this initial primordial impulse to control, to control our fear of that which is, or the fear of, of primitive people, uh, of being overwhelmed by this sort of immense uh, and incomprehensible force, there comes a kind of new counterforce which has its own, uh, which has its own logic uh, and which uh, can't be controlled since it is itself the very principle of control. Uh, it is itself the very principle of, uh, uh, of power. Page 57. The formula for the cunning of Odysseus is that the redeemed and instrumental spirit, by resigning itself to yield to nature, renders to nature what is nature's and yet betrays it in the very process. So this is yet another uh, version of the strategy of this strategy of domination, or this ruse of the very power of domination itself. Uh, we have so this is a kind of third uh, third possibility. The first one was that um, uh, was the was the very submission of the the, the very um, uh, substitution of a, a relationship of domination for, for the other relationships that we can entertain to the outside world. The second is a kind of insensible passage of that uh, relationship to the outside world to our relationships to other people. Finally, this, uh, the very logic of domination inscribes itself in, um, in ways of behavior which, which seem very different. That is, in Odysseus' case, uh, you don't try to dominate outside forces because you know uh, Odysseus is here reinterpreted in a kind of Brechtian way. You know that the outside world is too strong, so you're, uh, you adopt the strategy of ruse, which is always that of the weaker and the cleverer uh, than that of the strong. And you try to master uh, your, the threats from the outside world by submitting to them. Uh, you inscribe the power, this kind of mindless power of what crushes human life, you inscribe that in your strategy, and thus uh, you, uh, um, uh, you pull that, that motive force, you, 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 you push that motive force in the direction of your own projects. But nonetheless, uh, what this ends up doing is precisely, uh, this, is not, uh, this is not a return to some uh, innocent way of living in nature, but rather uh, it's a, it's a, it is itself yet another strategy of domination. This would be, uh, this is, would be their adaptation, you see, of Nietzsche's, of Nietzsche's vision of history, where finally one day uh, the, the weak uh, are tired of being dominated by the strong, and so they decide to invent a whole ideology by which, uh, and this is then for Nietzsche religion and so forth, Christianity, uh, and then modern forms of the, the, the various ideologies of modern intellectuals, whereby uh, the strong are persuaded to submit to the, to the weak. Uh, 
who are the intellectuals. Uh, and, and the Nietzschean slave ethic uh, uh, develops and is then Nietzsche's mode of explaining um, all kinds of uh, collective behavior in modern time. Well, in a sense, Adorno and Horkheimer have adapted that idea of, uh, of the will to power that's present even in apparent types of submission. Uh, for example, the will to power in Christian charity, uh, where uh, for Nietzsche, you, you submit uh, and you, uh, you, uh, you, you love the other and are charitable to the other really only in a more subtle way to dominate the other and to, and to enforce gratitude and, and things of that kind. Uh, so this ruse of the will to power uh, is then for Adorno and Horkheimer present in, uh, also in this, uh, in this attitude towards na in nature, uh, this ruse of, 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 uh, of Odysseus, uh, which is therefore still in, in, infected then by, um, by the very logic of domination. Page 84. Science, in general, relates to nature and man only as the insurance company, in particular, relates to life and death. Now, that's a real aphorism. Um, and it, it is the first appearance, at least in these things that I've chosen, of the notion of science. Because, of course, the other word for this, I used the word technology, but the other word for this process of domination, when it finally finds its, liberates itself conceptually and becomes a kind of self-developing uh, conceptual thing, is precisely science. And this is, uh, this is and will be and wishes itself to be a, a very basic and fundamental uh, critique of science. But there's another uh, key idea that's coming through at this point and, and that I think we have to stop. We'll, we'll go back to the matter of science in a minute, too. Uh, but I think, that, I think we want to gloss here for a second. Uh, and it's the notion of uh, content that I think I talked a little bit about uh, last time, using it for somewhat different purposes. Uh, there, one of the things that they reproach with, uh, that they reproach science uh, and the whole, um, the whole project of domination with uh, is, um, uh, uh, is of absolute formalization. That is, um, uh, their idea, and since this is being used in a special, rather Hegelian way, I'll, I'll explain it a little further. Formalization not in the sense of uh, appeal to mathematics or, uh, or the, the, the urge to transform uh, your, your thoughts about a book into a formula or whatever, and that's a very powerful kind of, uh, kind of temptation today, but uh, not only in that sense, but in a more basic sense that the very, um, uh, the very uh, aim of formalization is to eliminate the need for reference to any particular situation. Uh, and it's the connection to a particular situation that in the Hegelian tradition would still be called content. So we're not talking about uh, content in the kind of, uh, in the uh, way that the new critics used to attack descriptions of content, but in a much more specific way. That is, we're talking about the refusal of any kind of situational thought. Uh, so that, when you, uh, and, and this is obviously true, if uh, you have a formalized description of something, and yet that description only refers to a certain set of situations, and every time you talk about it, you have to say, but remember that uh, these people lived in this particular uh, kind of um, uh, kind of landscape, and they did this particular. Uh, they had this particular kind of technology, and so on. Then uh, your your description. Uh, is somehow imperfect because you've had to reintroduce content back into it. So the point about, uh, for Adorno and Horkheimer, the point about uh, the, the logic of science the, uh, is, um, is this elimination of content, which in human terms means uh, the elimination of, um, uh, of, uh, the, of references to specific uh, historical and national situations, that is to say, the, uh, the elimination of uh, historical thought in general, because if you have a, uh, a scientific formula for something, you want it to be valid uh, 
in all situations, that is, you don't want it to be historically bound. You don't want to have to go back and say, well, this law is only true uh, in, uh, uh, in this period of human history, because then you would have the, a very odd idea of a law which also, uh, at a certain moment, wasn't a law and then became a law and then later on went out of being as a law and so on. Uh, so one of the things that content means here uh, is history. Uh, and the other thing that it means is um, psychological history or the history of the individual, or in other words, individual life. Now, uh, how can one, it seems easy enough to eliminate history from thought because in this culture people do it every day and whole disciplines are based on doing it and, uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, it can be done. Um, but uh, it's a little harder to see how, um, uh, how one can, uh, how a process of formalization can eliminate the content of individual life. This is where Adorno and Horkheimer's notion of self-preservation comes in. Their idea is that the ultimate form of, the, the ultimate uh, form taken by this drive to eliminate content, by this formalization, when you're talking about human beings, is, um, uh, is the, uh, re, the, 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 the rewriting of the, uh, the materials of human life, of individual human lives, in terms of what in the, 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 the digital language is called an off-on principle. Uh, and the, the ultimate, how can I put it, let, let me put it another way around. The most formalized drive in any human life, as that drive which would, be, which would have the least content, would be the drive for self-preservation because uh, that's a principle which doesn't involve um, the attachment to some particular unique kind of activity that, you're, that, 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 that means something to you and that you affirm as opposed to other kinds of activities. It doesn't mean the affirmation of values of place or situation or whatever. Uh, it's something which is absolutely abstractable. It can be represented as plus minus. Either you're alive or you're not. Either you manage to stay alive or you don't. So somehow, uh, for Adorno and Hor Horkheimer, the notion of self-preservation and the way that this little by little inscribes itself into various systems, into the system of conscient ethics, for example, becomes a kind of key symptom of increasing formalization. Uh, and obviously looked at from the point of view of, uh, of um, great political and historical decisions, uh, it's the principle of statistics, right? That is, uh, all, you, uh, all you have to worry about in connection with uh, batches of people is uh, how many of them are living and how many of them are dead, and, that's, uh, uh, and thereby uh, content is, uh, is effectively uh, eliminated there too. We'll come back to this in a moment when we talk a little more about, um, about the relationship of this to uh, ethics. Okay, page 140. <clears throat> what we haven't mentioned yet, of course, uh, after science is aesthetics and art. So I read you this, um, this very basic aphorism. The secret of aesthetic sublimation is its representation of fulfillment as a broken promise. This, I think, has the whole secret of what Adorno will later call negative dialectics in it. Uh, and it has also the whole secret of, their, uh, of the Frankfurt School's analysis of art and of their relationship to the utopian uh, principle. Maybe, uh, maybe since many people know this, um, uh, know the work of the Frankfurt School through Martin Jay's dialectical imagination, we might pause and say a little something about that. It seems to me that Jay's book is a very, I, th I think I haven't mentioned that before, have I? Or, uh, it's a very useful, uh, extremely rich uh, documentation on um, the, um, the work, the collective work of the school. It tells us a lot about things that we wouldn't otherwise know about in English or about the works of people like Eric Fromm that we don't necessarily uh, associate with the Frankfurt School's work in the late 20s and so forth. Uh, it covers a lot of ground, although unfortunately it doesn't go past their return to Germany, and so it leaves out the very interesting story of, uh, of what happened to the Frankfurt School when it confronted its own children or grandchildren in the form of the German New Left in the 
in the late uh, in the late 60s. Uh, nonetheless, it's I think a very valuable book, and I'm not. And the critique I want to make is uh, uh, is not uh, intended to, um, uh, to, uh, to 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 neglect that informational aspect of it. But I've come to feel um, that there's something extremely misleading in this uh, in this work, uh, and it's. It's uh, Jay's um, use of one of the later slogans, one of the slogans of the later Frankfurt School, as the guiding thread and the organizing principle of his book. Obviously, uh, it's, uh, there are uh, aesthetic and formal reasons why it's very nice to have a single strand run through everything that you can uncover. But it seems to me that it's precisely the insistence on this strand which tends really to misrepresent uh, the, the, the everything that's that's important in the Frankfurt School. The theme that he chooses as this organizing device is what he calls non-identity theory. Uh, that is to say, um, uh, it's by, um, it's th through uh, uh, his uh, suggestion that uh, all of the Frankfurt School's thinking about aesthetics, politics, uh, philosophy, and the like, uh, is really uh, concerned to prevent the, uh, the illusion of some ultimate identity, some ultimate utopian reconciliation, the kind of thing which is denied by this aphorism I just read, uh, its representation of fulfillment as a broken promise. Um, uh, it's uh, by, uh, by uh, insisting on this that Jay seeks uh, to distinguish the Frankfurt School from Lukács, whom he claims was still uh, from the Lukács of, hist of history and class consciousness, and thus from a more orthodox Marxist tradition. Uh, this stuff is sometimes hideously called neo-Marxism, uh, which means all kinds of different things, but I think mainly it means it's not really Marxism anymore. Uh, uh, it's through, uh, it's through um, his suggestion that Lukács really believes in identity, whereas the Frankfurt School made uh, the principle of non-identity, their, uh, their fundamental polemic, um, uh, their fundamental uh, polemic purpose, uh, it's uh, thereby that he, um, uh, that he, uh, uh, I think is also trying to make a political point about, um, about the work of the Frankfurt School. Now, I th it seems to me that um, this is a very, this is a very difficult argument to make. Uh, in a sense, uh, Jay's presentation of the Frankfurt School, uh, and also then I think much of Adorno's negative dialectics uh, uh, authorizes him to do this, but again, that's a late work, uh, tends to assimilate their work to what we'll see Derrida doing. That is, it tends to, to say, I think one can uh, fairly, uh, without too much misrepresentation, suggest that uh, where there is a critique of identity, ultimate dialectical reconciliation, okay? um, that, uh, that that critique uh, is very similar in spirit to Derrida's critique of presence. That is, uh, both late Frankfurt School critique of identity and Derrida's critique of presence, both of these things are critiques of utopian illusions. Uh, of the illusion that ultimately at the end of the dialectic or at the end of something, of history, uh, whatever, there is, uh, there is a moment when, uh, when the distance from reality uh, or when the dissonance or the contradiction in the present uh, is overcome. Uh, and so uh, we have a vision then of some ultimately non-contradictory presence or unity or reconciliation, which is uh, maybe uh, the end of history, since very most frequently this critique uh, is done on the political level. Uh, we'll see it in Derrida's discussion uh, when every so often it breaks through and it's clear that he's talking as much about Marxism as about, uh, as about other forms of structuralism. Uh, and it's true in Jay and late, uh, late Adorno. Now, um, uh, and I think the idea of this is, of course, that um, behind that this kind of utopianism is bad because uh, ultimately uh, it produces Stalinism, I suppose, in that anything is possible if, you can, if, you, if you're able to, to make yourself believe that some future is qualitatively different from this present, then anything is really authorized to pass from this present into that future, 
uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, that's a part of a more general post-structural critique of absence and lack, which I think is most powerfully uh, expressed in the anti-Oedipus of Deleuze and Gattari. Uh, and I may read you a section from that a little later today, too. Now, the reason I think this is a very paradoxical argument to make, so it's assumed that Lukács, however, believed in this, because Lukács believed, as we know, that uh, the proletariat was the identical subject-object of history, that uh, uh, at the end of uh, bourgeois society would come some other form of society in which um, the, uh, the contradictions of middle-class thought wouldn't obtain any longer, and so on and so forth. And I suppose, uh, in a sense, uh, all, uh, all revolutionary practice is implicitly informed by some such belief that, uh, uh, that qualitatively different social forms are possible, because otherwise uh, there wouldn't be any point to changing this one. Now, uh, the reason this seems to me, this seems to me that this um, is then a critique of a certain type of utopian thought, now once again used in the bad sense, where uh, what was most powerful in the Frankfurt School um, and where they were related to one of the other really seminal uh, thinkers of, of modern times, the late Ernst Bloch, was precisely their reinvention of the utopian in a very different sense and in a sense which no longer uh, has uh, the connotations that it had when Marx, for example, denounced utopian socialism and when an, everybody else uh, denounced it too. Now, uh, the reason this argument is paradoxical is that, for example, uh, is that it seems to me that it tends to arrest and destroy the tension that makes, that makes for the force of the thought of the Frankfurt School. The minute you believe that, you see, you have to believe in identity in order for your critique of identity to have some kind of meaning. The minute you lay it out as a principle, non-identity, uh, you don't bother about identity anymore. So you're content to live in contradiction, live in the present, so on and so on. Uh, and there's no, no longer even any point in criticizing the utopian impulse because it isn't there anymore. Uh, now, um, I, 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 this aphorism, it seems to me, shows, on the other hand, the proper use of this notion of, of, this notion of the critique of identity, the secret of aesthetic sublimation is its representation of fulfillment as a broken promise. This means that at one and the same time, in, in, within a single aesthetic representation, you see at once the possibility of utopian gratification and the fact, and doubly the fact of its failure. Its failure in the present because you don't have it, and its failure uh, on another level, because in a sense, utopian gratification doesn't lie in art, since art is, uh, is the realm of, uh, of the, uh, of the um, unpurposeful purpose or uh, of the suspension of, of reality or however you, how, however you want to d d define it. So that what art does, in, according to this formulation, is not only to criticize identity theory, right? It's not only to show that uh, fulfillment is impossible, that uh, utopian gratification fails, uh, is not only, therefore, to, to constitute a critique of the utopian impulse, but it's also to reinvent it and, to, and, to, uh, and to, to, to make it happen all over again. And it seems to me that the, the whole aesthetics of the, uh, of the Frankfurt School, and here Marcuse is very closely related to them, uh, is precisely predicated on, on, uh, on the idea that we've lost the sense of, um, we've lost the very idea of the utopian impulse. That something about our society uh, tends, uh, tends to, uh, to push us ever more deeply into the existent, uh, to the point where we can't imagine anything radically different from that existence. We simply imagine more of the same, or if you like, in a kind of off-on uh, principle, we imagine its destruction, maybe. But neither of those things is, uh, uh, is really a way of imagining radical difference. Uh, and there's a whole description, both in Marcuse and in, uh, and in Adorno, of how, um, 
why it is that uh, in, this, uh, in this particular form of commodity or consumer society, why little by little the very logic of this society is the gradual elimination of another word for the utopian impulse, negativity. So that uh, little by little we can't imagine anything else than this. And so the utopian impulse atrophies. Now, if that's the case, then it seems to me that uh, it's very misguided uh, to, to, to sell the Frankfurt School as a critique of, uh, uh, of utopias when precisely the, 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 the thrust of their thought, and what's very different from, uh, from contemporary French thought, is the affirmation of the importance of this impulse, the importance of the negative, of what does not exist, or as Bloch would say, what does not yet exist, the not yet, uh, the novum, and so forth. Uh, and what happens when you do that, I think, uh, and this, I think, is, is what um, the aesthetics that Marcuse is writing today, uh, uh, what's happening to that, uh, what, you do, uh, what you do to the, to, to the originality of the thought of the Frankfurt School by insisting on the non-identity principle is simply to turn them back into existentialism. And at that point, uh, because existentialism was also a critique of, uh, of presence in, in that sense, and, uh, uh, and a kind of uh, insistence on um, uh, the, 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 non, the structural non-fulfillment of, of human existence the impossibility of, uh, of, of the realization of this kind of structural drive that human beings have to become what Sartre calls the en soi, pro soi, the in itself, for itself, a, a, a presence which would be a consciousness at the same time. Uh, and of course, at that point then, uh, if you want to reduce them to existentialism, that's fine, but then, uh, then we have to reinvent another Frankfurt School which would do all the things that they were most interesting and, and, and innovative for, for, for having done. Page 147. Now we're talking not about art so much as about art in the consumer world, in the rationalized world, uh, in, the, in the commodity world, and so we're talking no longer so much about aesthetics as about what Adorno calls uh, the, um, uh, the culture industry or what uh, Enzensberger later calls it the consciousness industry. The words, and this describes then the language of the culture industry, of the objects of the culture industry. The words that are not means appear senseless. The others seem to be fiction, untrue. So that uh, little by little, the, the diagnosis of the culture industry will now, I think, um, follow, uh, uh, take place in the framework that I was outlining the last time, the framework of instrumentalization. Uh, instrumentalization means turning everything into a means, uh, a means for which uh, the end is not a new type of content, is not a quality, but rather an off-on principle, success or failure. Um, in, that, in a world in which everything has become means, in which everything has become instrumentalized, what happens to things which uh, we're told were not supposed to be practical, that is, art, uh, language, aesthetic language? Well, uh, this is what happens. These uh, the, the, uh, words, are, words, language, aesthetic discourse, is little by little, in spite of itself, sucked into the world of instrumentalization and made to be instrumental. So that uh, in this new situation, which is that of, uh, of aesthetics today, of, of, of our world of discourse, of our world of our various discourses today, in that world then, the words that are not means appear senseless. Nobody knows why uh, everything has to have a purpose. Uh, so uh, a little by little, a kind of writing or put it the other way around, what would be ultimately subversive in a world of pure means, in a linguistic world of pure means, would be words that don't have a purpose. But unfortunately, that's hard to maintain. You could say that surrealism tried to do that, for example. Surrealism tried to tap a source of uh, linguistic production, uh, which was extra-worldly, that is, which didn't come out of the world of means and ends, but which came from a, some other source and which was thus profoundly useless the way dreams are useless. 
But of course, one of the rhythms of commodity society is that then um, you invent something called surrealism. It becomes a commodity. Uh, there becomes a new end, which is to produce surrealist texts. And somehow, uh, that's no longer accessible in a little while as a source of, uh, of words that escape the commodity world and the instrumentalized world. And you're back in that world, and you have to think of something else. Well, uh, the, the most recent, uh, the most recent um, uh, aesthetic, which uh, among others, which tries to do this, or at least the most striking, then becomes, and this then is felt to be something far more uh, radical even than surrealism, uh, is uh, the world of schizophrenic discourse. Because presumably what's shocking and astonishing about schizophrenic discourse is that it precisely, it uh, of all types of discourses serves no purpose at all, no communicational purpose, no other purpose, and so ultimately you hope you've touched bottom and, and finally found some kind of discourse which would be radically, absolutely subversive of the world of instrumentalization because it can't be used for anything and because the people who are saying it are not saying it for any purpose at all. Uh, and that's the sense in which, um, uh, in which Deleuze uh, uh, and, and others uh, have valorized the, the world of schizophrenic writing. And I think uh, that's something that we have to take very very seriously, that is, there is a, uh, there, this is a new aesthetic, uh, and I think one doesn't appreciate how distinct it is from older modernisms like surrealism, unless you've read some of the basic texts, they're not all absolutely contemporary, but there are a few that I could indicate to you for sort of reading over the vacation or when you're in a schizophrenic mood and, and as a way of preparing this and also as a way of raising the issue of whether there is a postmodernism after modernism, whether, uh, w whether aesthetics today in uh, a world which is even more instrumentalized in consumer society than it was uh, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, whether there is not also a dialectical transformation in aesthetics. Uh, the texts I would recommend are uh, Georg Büchner's little fragment called Lenz. This is a text of the, about Goethe's, um, uh, Goethe's fellow playwright who uh, went insane. It's a kind of very brief biographical novel about Lenz, uh, written in the 1830s, I think. Uh, you should look, uh, if you don't know his work, at the Austrian novelist, this is a contemporary, Thomas Bernhardt. Uh, there are um, several texts in English, the one that I remember the translation that I remember, I think it's called Grotesques. Uh, and if you read French, uh, there is the text that uh, Deleuze himself um, uh, refers to here, which, uh, which is indeed, as he says, a remarkable text and not at all known, by Jacques Bess called La Grande Pâque. It's, uh, it's sort of hard. I don't know whether we have that in this uh, in this library. It's not, this is the only reference I've ever seen to it, but it's a very interesting text. Again, what, what uh, Deleuze calls a schizophrenic promenade, like the promenade surrealiste, except that where the surrealist walked in order to note interesting, bizarre objects to get images in a sense, the schizophrenic walks just to be part of the machine, which is nature, and, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, there are the more better known things like Beckett. Beckett's Molloy is a schizophrenic text. The, 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 the aesthetic novelty of these things is that now this is a kind of text which is being produced presumably without a subject. Uh, and the schizophrenic text gives us an idea of a kind of language which speaks itself and which doesn't need a subject anymore. At any rate, um, it's in that, it seems to me it's still in the context of the situation that Adorno and Horkheimer were talking about when they named the culture industry and when they described the paradoxical uh, and yet impossible um, uh, tendency of consumer society to instrumentalize language and aesthetics and, and art objects. It's in that context that, some, uh, that the radical novelty of, of a schizophrenic literature can be, um, can be understood. Here's another uh, aphorism on the same page. Now he's talking about how, uh, page 147, how um, the objects of the art objects advertisements and so on of uh, the culture industry function. He says, ideology is split into the photograph of stubborn life and the naked lie about its meaning, which is not expressed but suggested and yet drummed in. That is to say, uh, there's a kind of absolute separation now between uh, the object and the things you say about it and the very existence of the object which you can't 
bring into doubt, that is, uh, you see, and, and this is the, the, the very specificity of photography itself, that is, you know that uh, you're looking at things which do have a reality, that's the photograph tells you that, we believe it implicitly, and so on. And that existence then documents anything else that, uh, that, that the photograph is used for. Uh, this is said again in a sentence I like on the next page. Uh, he's talking about now about, um, oh, the, the typist who wins the world trip. Um, uh, uh, the, the disappointment of the prospect that one might be the typist who wins the world trip is matched by the disappointing appearance of the accurately photographed areas in which the voyage might include. Then they say, not Italy is offered, but evidence that it exists. Uh, and the ad or the photograph documents this existence which no longer has anything to do with you. In a sense, this structure of the, um, of the commodity object, of the, of the ad, is the reversal of the utopian structure of the work of art. Both are predicated on disjunction, on uh, the failure to connect the thing and its idea. But, but the two are reversed here. Uh, and the message of the commodity uh, of the ad is everything is there. Uh, it, the world exists, that's the only thing that's important, uh, and so forth. The, the message of the utopian text, of the, of the work of art, of the real work of art, says the contrary, nothing that's really important exists yet. Uh, utopian realization is impossible in the context of this world, this art language, and so on and so forth. And yet, by telling you that, it reawakens that thing which is not supposed to be there, namely utopia. Uh, a few more, uh, and then I'll try to put all this in a more logical, um, uh, in a more logical sequence. Um, here now is another uh, basic theme, that of which we've touched on already implicitly by talking about schizophrenia, that of the fate, the status of the subject in, in a world like this. Uh, we're telling a historical story, after all, in which uh, little by little, uh, the, a kind of Frankenstein monster, namely the, the very impulse to dominate, to control, the will to power over nature, uh, which is what we call, which we call science, technology, and so forth, has taken over and has created a world in its own image, a completely instrumentalized world. We've seen what the fate of, um, uh, of content is in that world. We've seen what the fate of art is in that world. What about the fate of the subject? Uh, because, as we know, um, an attempt to radically subvert that world through uh, purposeless language also ends up getting rid of the subject, too, which is what schizophrenic discourse would presumably do. Uh, now, here, Adorno and Horkheimer are at their furthest remove from the thought of people like Deleuze and from the French tradition, and that's why this matter of the subject is, is of great interest and I think, uh, and, and will be a, a theme that will trace through the things we talk about uh, in the future. Uh, meanwhile, a few, um, a few uh, initial um, uh, notes. Um, every advance, 155. Every advance in individuation of this kind, and he's talking then about how subjects come into being, right? how we form the ego and little by little form this sort of recognizable center of habits and values and so on that, that, that allows us to remember who we are when we wake up the next day, which schizophrenics don't do and which define schizophrenics. That is, they don't have that, they don't have that continuity or they don't form their, the raw material, the flux, as Deleuze will, will say, of their lives back into that organic unity, into that uh, uh, which, uh, which we keep trying to do. Um, the, um, every advance in individuation, another word for the coming into being of the subject, every advance in individuation of this kind took place at the expense of the individuality in whose name it occurred so that nothing was left but the resolve to pursue one's own particular purpose. Here, in a very succinct way, it seems to me the same dialectic that will characterize the, the, the impulse to dominate as a whole is, is, is at stake. We have apparently a progressive development, individuation, the creation of the subject. But this creation of the subject is a self-unraveling thing. 
which will destroy everything that it's created in the name of, and at the end of its process will leave not full subjects, but rather purely instrumental subjects who are only there, what do they say, to pursue their own particular purpose. That is to say, who are absolutely inserted in the, in the network of means and ends, and who are there only for that, and therefore whose ultimate overriding law is again the law of self-preservation because that's the only, uh, that's the purest, most formal uh, uh, way for a, a subject to think about its own, uh, its own existence. Page 193. Now we come back to the, the very inner logic of, uh, of the impulse to dominate, of rationalization, uh, of the will to power of science and so forth and we try to describe what's going on within that. Objectifying thought, like sick thought, contains the despotism of the subjective purpose which is hostile to the thing and forgets the thing itself, thus committing the mental act of violence which is later put into practice. Now here I think the point is that, uh, again, this is a very Nietzschean diagnosis of the inner will to power, we would say even, that's the Nietzschean side of Freud, I guess, the inner hidden aggressivity of science itself. Science uh, apparently wants to know out of reality. Uh, but in fact, according to this diagnosis, it hates out of reality. It wants to control it and get rid of it. Uh, and therefore, uh, this objectifying logic of science, which organizes outer reality into the purely formal, uh, is also dialectically at one with a, a very passionate kind of subjective uh, investment, which is, which is aggressivity towards these objects of the outside world. This is carried over into the very logic of science itself, so that the mental act of violence, which is knowing something abstractly, in modern, in the epistemolog epistemological terms of modern science, uh, is a symbolic way of killing the object, and then will later on be matched by its acting out in the real world, when in fact you do kill the objects, you blow them up. Uh, you find out all about the world, and then you, uh, then you destroy it. Uh, and so, uh, but this is already implicit in the very logic of scientific knowledge itself. And finally, I have on page 195, um, the counter position to all this, because after all, this is a diagnosis which hasn't yet shown the position from which it's being made, the Archimedean point from which one could say all this, if everything in modern times is instrumentalized, uh, then why is, isn't your thought instrumentalized too? Um, uh, how is it possible to know these things about, if this were true about the modern world, you couldn't say it or you couldn't know it and so on and so forth. Uh, if this impulse is absolute uh, in scientific thought, which is after all what our whole civilization is based on, is there some other kind of thought which would, what would it be? Is it non-scientific and thus irrational? Well a language that, that's this hyper-intellectual is probably not a regressive or an irrational language, or at least if it were, then uh, it, could, it could do all this uh, the, way, uh, the way it's done in action, simply by burning books, and we wouldn't need to have very elaborate theories of what's the matter with science. So there's a missing ingredient here, which is uh, that kind of thinking, which will, if not overcome, at least have, have the property to diagnose What's the matter with the other dominant kind of thinking? That will ultimately be called um, critical theory, which is their, their code word for dialectical uh, thought or for historical materialism. Uh, but here uh, in this uh, passage, we see it reveal itself as a self-consciousness. Um, reflection, which in a healthy person breaks the power of immediacy, is never so compelling as the illusion which it dispels. So we have an initial position of reflection. You draw back from an object. You become aware of it and aware of yourself thinking about it. You thus disperse the immediacy of your relationship to the object. And here uh, we have to talk about the, the Hegel's use of this conception because I think it'll be very important, again, for understanding Derrida later on, 
Uh, Hegel has a term, not just immediacy, but he talks about bad immediacy, by which he means when you're in the world up to your eyes and you have no distance from it. Uh, you have a kind of subject-object relationship, that is, the subject is as close to the object as can be imagined, but uh, what's the good of that kind of closeness when you don't even know what your, what your relationship, when, you, when you're not even aware that you're a subject and it's an object and so on and so forth. So um, philosophy says, uh, says Hegel, and this is the very beginning of the phenomenology of spirit, uh, because you begin with uh, this stage of immediate, uh, immediacy itself when you're in the world and you have no distance at all from it. Philosophy will try to break this bad immediacy, uh, break our links, with the immediate world of sense perception and so forth, stand back over that, understand it, and then little by little, and here's identity again, and here's the whole myth of ultimate presence and the myth of utopia and so on, ultimately then uh, the subject and the ob object will come back together beyond philosophy, beyond time, in absolute spirit, in utopian reconciliation. So the whole myth of the dialectic, which is being attacked by, by some of the other people, uh, is, is, uh, is here present. Well, uh, in, um, in, in Adorno, um, uh, the, point about this, um, uh, the point about this dialectic is that there are reasons why uh, it doesn't, there's structural tendencies why this theodicy of reconciliation tends not to happen. Uh, and these are uh, at one with the very title of this book. So when we're through with this, we'll go back to the to, to the to the very basic, the very basic point of it, with the dialectic of enlightenment, with the dialectical twist that there is, the dialectical reversal that there is in the very historical development of enlightenment itself, of reason, of control, and so on. Reflection which in a healthy person breaks the power of immediacy. It makes you stand back over against the object. Think about how you're understanding it. What are your mental instruments for understanding it? This would be then a dialectical way of, uh, of a, a mode of dialectical thought in which you're both thinking about your own, uh, the, the structure of your own thinking and the object that you're thinking about at once. Reflection is never so compelling, so strong, so powerful as the illusion which it dispels. Reflection does two things. It gets rid of superstition. It is a principle of enlightenment. The whole point about enlightenment is the premise that around us there are shadows, superstitions, bad immediacy, things, uh, belief in various kinds of animisms and so on. Uh, and, the very, uh, the, and, and these things are linked in classical enlightenment, of course, to political despotism because superstition is at one with the church and with, uh, with the, the domination of, uh, of uh, the arbitrary and the tyrant in the whole kind of um, uh, period, mythic period view of the Ancien Regime. Uh, so to get rid of these, uh, the, these superstitious thoughts will be also to perform an act of political revolution in that uh, this will get rid of the, uh, of the arbitrary power structures which are reinforced by those thoughts, Voltaire's Oedipus, which is a story really not Freud's story, not Deleuze's story, but a story of somebody dominated by priests, Tiresias as the wicked priest who was, um, who was destroying uh, Oedipus. Um, this is one of the impulses of uh, the, even the most basic of enlightenment. But uh, the point that uh, Adorno will want to make about this impulse is that it is self-unraveling because uh, it's a progressive thing. Enlightenment is a kind of historical trajectory in which every previous stage becomes superstition. So that as it goes along, it renounces its own prehistory as well as every other form of prehistory. It buries the archaic. That's very, very distant. Uh, the, the whatever, whatever there once was in the way either of primitive life or of libidinal existence has long since been, uh, been layered and, uh, and lost to sight under the various, uh, the, this, this, the successive uh, levels of enlightenment which have been built on it. 
So if the first moment, if one can imagine it first in this dialectic, if the very first moment of the coming into being of enlightenment is a kind of what Freud would call kind of primal repression, you get rid of the, of the archaic, every successive mode is secondary because what you're getting rid of is not just the archaic, but also your own prehistory as enlightenment. You say, for example, um, well, um, and this is true in the development of science, right? Every previous period in the development of science looks quaint and, uh, and somehow uh, no longer scientific to us because, uh, because it, is, it seems to be still wrapped up with its own errors in ways that, uh, that, that we seem no longer to be. And so um, uh, Adorno points out that, for example, uh, there's a whole change shift in position in, in the way we read these texts. Kant, which would seem to be uh, the very uh, front line or cutting edge of enlightenment in the sense of all of the things which Kant tells us uh, it is no longer scientific to bother thinking about origins, uh, ultimate uh, uh, purpose, the noumenon, and so on and so on. Uh, Kant, from the point of view of later positivism, looks superstitious. Because Kant is still, uh, how, how, what is this formulation about atheism, which I like here, let me see if I can find it, I'm not sure that I noted it down. Um, page 25. In a later, in a later position, atheism would then be, I don't say that Kant was an atheist, but atheism would assert, at a certain point be, uh, a, a, a fundamental advanced position of enlightenment uh, and a, uh, a, the attempt to posit uh, a whole universe absolutely governed by law and so on and so on. Um, for positivism, but later on, even atheism becomes a sign of superstition because atheism still believes something. Right? Atheism believes a proposition about the universe. But for later positivism, even that is metaphysical. So um, uh, this kind of mimesis in which universal thought is equalized so turns the actual into the unique that even atheism itself is subjected to the ban on metaphysics. For positivism, which represents the court of judgment of enlightened reason, to digress into intelligible worlds is no longer merely forbidden, but meaningless prattle. It does not need, fortunately, to be atheistic, because objectified thinking cannot even raise the problem any longer. So, uh, uh, and thus, he says, uh, the positivist censor lets the established cult escape as willingly as art, as a cognition-free special area of social activity, but he will never permit that denial of it, atheism, which itself claims to be knowledge. So there's a kind of dynamic process here whereby even whereby uh, it's, it's, one has to say it in a different way from this whole exhaustion of raw materials that, that we would talk about in consumer society, although those are really very closely related. There's a process here whereby somehow the way, the way the revolution devours its children, so also the very, this uh, very principle of advance and of kind of a constant, almost a, a scientific modernism, a make it new on the level of, of epistemology and knowledge, whereby this must disown its own ancestors. Dialectical thinking is superstition. We have to have absolutely objectified thought, that is, uh, positivist thought. Uh, and, uh, and at that point, this absolutely objectified thought will no longer have any content of its own, will be absolutely irrational in the sense that it'll be just means gone wild and absolute instrumentalization. So the trajectory that goes, if you like, from, from Bacon or from Aristotle to Auschwitz. That is, uh, uh, Auschwitz in this book, uh, as I think I told you before, is, is, a, is, a, uh, is written 
very much in, in the mid-40s under the very sign of that particular uh, aberrant uh, technology. Auschwitz, however, is not aberrant for them. Auschwitz is the full, ultimate realization of, the, uh, of instrumentalization. Uh, it's uh, modern technology which has found uh, its, ultimate, uh, its ultimate realization as something which has no ends but off-on ends, in that case, uh, ends of, um, of, uh, of liquidation, which has no further content. So it's a the absolutely formalized. Now, uh, the point here is that, um, is that this is not something, not a misuse of science by wicked people or something, but for Adorno and Horkheimer, it's something that's Im implicit in this very logic of enlightenment itself. From, uh, from the philosophe of the 18th century to Auschwitz. Essentially, that's, this is the paradox, the historical paradox, which is being, uh, which is being described here. Uh, and the historical trajectory, the historical paradigm, which, uh, which is registered in the title, this is why it's a dialectic, because it's a reversal. It's a passage of, oh, something like a uh, passage of quantity to quality in, in, in Hegel, where you add so much and suddenly there's a kind of a reversal of direction. Uh, this is what happens by in, with increasing knowledge. It's, it's not that reason is used for the irrational, it ultimately, as it becomes more and more reason, suddenly it is the irrational. Yes. Well, because uh, I think, f for one thing, those things are also very difficult to gauge in a, in the framework of a uh, of a description of of consumer society. Uh, I think th the other thing that uh, in, in, see, I think this is anticipatory of this book in, in several ways. It's, uh, it's historically bound in the, um, and, and um, uh, uh, it, it, it's, its tone and its, and its whole polemic function is given by the Nazi period and by the reflection on fascism, anti-Semitism, and so on. At the same time, uh, their American experience allowed them prophetically, I think, to anticipate a lot of things about consumer society that weren't necessarily evident to, to, to anybody else at that period and which have only recently become evident to lots of people and in Europe uh, uh, in, in the last, uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so. So uh, it seems to me that um, uh, it's, in that second, uh, it's in that second problem area that it becomes very difficult to, to give Marx and to say, well, uh, benef be beneficial technology, uh, uh, anti-humane technology, because now we're in a world of, uh, of, I don't know, kind of production of absolutely false, gratifi of, of false gratifications in which where one can't distinguish between true gratifications and false ones, because all of these commodities are produced by, uh, by uh, the principle of, uh, of instrumentalization. Uh, and so that kind of sorting out isn't possible as it might have been, say, in the 20s or at, a, at an earlier period. At least I think that would be the, 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 the place I'd look for an answer to that. I think, really, I think what's ultimately, I think one should, I think there are, there, there are different degrees of formulating this, uh, this thing. Now, in Marcuse, uh, the whole notion of technology is readjusted to, in, in, from a, to, to utopian point of view. And Marcuse uses the, this, this teaching about technology to project a utopian image of what might be realized in a society as advanced as this one. Uh, here, however, I think what it's most interesting to do is to push this to its furthest point, and then I think you'd have to say, no, the, the, the evil is in the very principle of technology itself. There is a principle of efficiency, production in technology, which is baleful in and of itself, and which can go nowhere. And this is, I think, why, or which goes everywhere, and that's where you don't want to go. And this is why uh, this can be linked up to a to a critique of, uh, of, uh, of, of, a, of a Soviet uh, technology uh, as well as to, uh, to Western technology.
Well, I think that's, that, that expresses the other, the, the, the basic problem of, 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 this, uh, of this work. Uh, I, would, I would begin to, um, I would begin to, I'd draw back a little bit from that and talk about it in terms of imagining the utopian. That is here, but especially in the later works, you have a picture of a society so completely instrumentalized that, um, uh, that as we said a minute ago, uh, even imagination is instrumentalized in it. Even imagination is unable to think in a utopian fashion. That means that we can't even get as far as what you're asking us to do. We can't even get as far as to imagine what a society would be like which was a non-instrumental society. Well, but efficiency is the same as, as instrumentality. That is, we're talking about a society for which efficiency is not a concept. See? We're, t we're talking about a society for which there's something else involved in the relationship to nature, uh, which would not be efficiency in the sense of means ends. Uh, and it would be, if we could imagine a society like that, but it's very hard for us to do that because precisely we're infected with instrumentality, the point where all of our pictures of previous societies tend to get re-instrumentalized whether we like it or not. So we look back at, at primitive tribes and we say, well, but this you can revive Rousseau or whatever. Uh, this here finally is a society which is, uh, which is non-instrumental and non-technological. And then as we begin to describe it, we find we've reintroduced production back into it, technology, instrumentality, and so on. So I think uh, the point at which uh, the Frankfurt School stops is a point well before uh, any official attempt of their own to, 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 to imagine utopia. That Marcuse was willing to do. Uh, that, I think, uh, Lévi-Strauss, in a different way, is, is willing to do. I think you can also even take the, 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 the praise of schizophrenia in, in Deleuze as, a, as a, another way of, of daring to imagine uh, a, a utopia which was non-instrumental. But in, uh, in Adorno and Horkheimer, I think they, uh, it, it goes to two different places. The, the attempt to imagine another, a radically different society, which would be non-instrumental, is for them closed off by what they consider to be the total system of world politics. For them, uh, the United States, the Soviet Union, all of that is, is of a piece. Uh, there is no place in that, uh, in that total system in which any kind of political otherness would be visible. They don't consider, for example, this is one of the big uh, historical uh, differences between them and their, their immediate students in the 60s. They don't consider that the Chinese experience was anything different, uh, but rather that that's also inscribed into this in the same logic. And so uh, ultimately, that the political, the political utopian imagination for them is blocked. So they look for it in other places. One is in art. Uh, and, but the, but the, the, the way utopia realizes itself in the greatest modern art is uh, not a full realization, but the one I, I tried to convey in that, in that aphorism I raised, that is uh, the, utopian, uh, the utopian principle is realized in art by art showing us its impossibility of realization. Uh, and I think the reckoning on this attempt to see art as utopian they're talking about modernism. Adorno was a composer. They're talking about Schoenberg. What the reckoning on that attempt to find a place for the utopian, even if it's only of an aesthetic type and not the existence of a real historical utopia, comes when modernism itself stops. That is, it seems to me that Adorno is unable to think anything beyond Beckett and, and Schoenberg uh, and is locked into a conception of modernism which, is, uh, it, it, which makes it clear that that modernism is now a historical phenomenon that's receding into the past. Uh, there's no place, clearly, for anything like this postmodern schizophrenic uh, stuff that, 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 that Deleuze uh, uh, talks about. Uh, and so even that possibility of imagining utopia in the suspension of the aesthetic finally collapses, I think, in Adorno. Even though, and his, his last work, Aesthetic Theory, which is his, his, his kind of testament, uh, 
um, it seems to me, uh, is, is a real regression on books like this. It simply rejoins the classical ideology of modernism that we've had from, from the early 20th century. There is yet another place where uh, something utopian, where, where some principle of action is kept alive, and that's uh, then in philosophy. That's in what's called negative dialectics. That is, that's in, uh, in accepting the fact that there are no pos positive positions anymore that one can hold, but, uh, but keeping alive the very notion of a positive philosophical position, even though it's not possible for us today. So, for example, Adorno says, uh, there are lots of possible critiques of Hegel, which say um, uh, absolute spirit clearly is, a, uh, is, not a, uh, is not a solution for us, not a conceptual solution, and so forth. But suppose it were the other way around. Supposing our inability to be Hegelians or to accept the kind of immense synthesis which is Hegel, suppose that that were not a judgment on Hegel, but on us. Suppose what that reflected were not Hegel's uh, own conceptual difficulties, but rather the impossibility of system, the impossibility of a complete philosophy in our own time. So the position of negative dialectics tries to keep open a utopian possibility by, even while you're being told that it's impossible in our, in, in, in our moment of history. This is a kind of very extreme mental acrobatics, and, uh, and I, think, uh, I think it's not, I think it too is, is not, I, when, one can't talk about success or failure when you're talking about an intellectual position, but it seems to me this is no longer really tolerable for us as a stance and as a strategy either but it's what they have to come to when little by little uh, they feel themselves being, uh, they, 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 they feel that history has no longer any place for, for realization of, uh, of the utopian. Now, um, here we have this. Uh, let me give you a few examples of the way in which um, this dialectic, uh, this dialectical reversal where, whereby Enlightenment turns into irrationality. Uh, the way this uh, the way this operates, because this is also a um, a historical progression. Uh, I'm going to be using this concept when I talk about the relationship of realism to modernism. That is, it seems to me my thesis there. Maybe we'll talk about that a little tomorrow. Would be that the same principle obtains in the, the passage from realism to modernism, realism being one of, the, one of the principles of enlightenment in the aesthetic realm. It's a principle of decoding, of rationalization, which little by little becomes so pervasive that it ends up unraveling itself and ceasing to be realistic and producing modernistic texts. And I think that uh, one of the, one possible solution of this um, endless uh, um, uh, problem of, of, uh, of the relationship of realism to modernism is offered, one possible model, is offered to us by precisely this, this picture of what happens to, um, uh, to reason. Now, I want to I wanna show how this is relevant to other things, though, bef besides the aesthetic. Uh, for example, in, um, uh, in their reading, their very beautiful reading of the Odyssey, obviously, there's something very paradoxical about this uh, about a book which tells you that um, the, first, the first great embodiment of bourgeois thought was Homer. Uh, and I think this tells us something, uh, or at least it projects a problem of telling historical stories that we want to come back to when we talk about Derrida, because this is the, this is the way he's looking at Rousseau. If you tell a story that has a beginning, where does the beginning go? That is, what happens to the beginning? What is the status of the beginning? It's also Said's. Uh, the, the subject of Said's book called Beginning. What is the status of the beginning? When you say, um, okay, uh, um, uh, science, uh, this is the logic of science. And then you look back and you find myth. And you say, well, myth was also an attempt to explain the world. Thus, even though for present day science, myth is its other, myth is the non-scientific, the irrational. Uh, there wasn't present day science when myth came in. For myth, myth is science. Myth is is in its own terms an attempt to dominate the world, to control the world, to explain natural forces. So the earliest forms of myth are already proto-science, and this, uh, this kind of um, uh, irrevocable uh, 
uh, curse, uh, uh, which is a hereditary uh, curse of scientific thought, uh, is already pronounced uh, when mythic thought, when, when the first myths are told. So uh, if you look at history in those terms, science, the genealogy of science goes all the way back into myth, then you have no problem seeing Homer and Odysseus as being uh, a, a prototype of this later kind of scientific way of dealing, dealing with the world. But then, of course, you have another problem, which is what came before that. Uh, this is the utopian problem at the other end of time. Not can we imagine utopias in the future, but if you have this, if all of our relationship to the world is somehow uh, in, informed by this will to power, uh, was there never a moment when that, when did that come into being? What was there before that? What is the archaic? What is the object of primal repression? What is it that the will to power blotted out? Some Rousseauian natural existence? Uh, that's not clear, but it means that we need at least two early terms rather than one. Uh, and so you have a kind of problem of what the natural is which will then be canceled. I put on the board uh, uh, a, a, a Derridian defense of, of uh, Adorno and Horkheimer the other day by writing nature uh, canceled out. That is, one can imagine a use of the word nature which would be, in Derrida's terms, under erasure. Uh, so you use it knowing that it's a myth. Uh, that would be another way of, of, of reading this, but in any case, you have a problem of beginning. So, uh, so this assimilation of the, uh, of, of the Odyssey to rationalism and to the Enlightenment is in one sense a kind of jeu d'esprit. Uh, uh, in another sense, it tells us that we can't look to, to Adorno and Horkheimer for a really, uh, for a, 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 a useful anthropological uh, view of myth in its, in its difference from, uh, from contemporary discourse, but we can read it as a kind of uh, fable, and indeed, uh, when they come to the Odyssey, it seems to me that it's a very remarkable reading in which each of the episodes, it's particularly what they're concerned with, is particularly the, the central section, the, uh, the various places that Odysseus is, uh, is marooned at. Each of those, uh, each of those things it provides us with a way of, of deducing the existence of an archaic repressed. Uh, I don't, we don't have time to go through all of them, but for example, um, uh, he talks about the, 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 the sirens, the episode of the sirens, is the utopian power of art itself, of course, which has to be controlled and repressed uh, in order to, to, be, uh, to be assimilated into the world of instrumentality. The lotus eaters represent then a far more physical form of gratification, and at that point, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer will talk about the sense of smell as being archaic. Smell and taste are archaic sense, senses. Uh, and therefore, they're not rationalizable like hearing. After all, hearing, uh, look at Ma um, uh, Max Weber's essay on music as rationalization. Hearing is uh, one of the most rationalizable of all the senses. These are, however, archaic senses in the sense that they atrophy in, in, civilized, uh, in civilized life, and thus they become the place where they become dangerous for civilization. Uh, smells are bad, you know, uh, in, in, at least in the new world. Uh, uh, that's a, that, those are signs that have to be absolutely wiped out and so on. And at the same time, then they become the place in which some kind of utopian gratification can be fantasized. Um, then we have the Cyclops, which represents a, a, a kind of pastoral existence that's wiped out, but also a, a pre-collective existence, and also a kind of primal stupidity, you see, the Cyclops, which is, uh, which is, to, be, uh, which is to be rationalized and done away. And finally, with Circe, Eros, and they quote this famous, uh, this, um, this uh, passage of the Odyssey that you may have forgotten, as I did, that when uh, Odysseus finally prevails over Circe and forces her to turn his men back into human beings. They had been turned into pigs and other kinds of animals. Um, Homer says this, let me see, I think they quote it. Um, Sweet, sour melancholy seized them all and the walls echoed with their weeping. This is when they become human beings again. Because the animal state was a profoundly 
gratifying kind of archaic existence, which now once again they've lost becoming human beings, coming back into the realm of, um, of um, civilization control and so forth. Finally, the, the descent into the, other, uh, into the underworld is for, uh, for uh, Adorno uh, essentially to be seen as the return to matriarchy. It's presided over by Odysseus' mother. Uh, and thus, uh, you have there, uh, this is a very, uh, somebody should really do a, a, a kind of historical study of this as a, as a very deep left uh, fantasy. It was nourished in the 19th century. The whole notion of, of the matriarch is primal by Bachhofen. It's in Engels. Uh, it's revived in Marcuse in various kinds of striking ways. Marcuse's notion of the maternal super id, which is the, the form which non uh, non-repressed uh, instinctuality will take is essentially a kind of psychic uh, matriarchy that's being that's being posed as uh, as a way of imagining a non-repressive society uh, of the future. And indeed, in Marcuse, uh, what's very striking and pro pro programmatic in the way the, the the knack that Marcuse has for turning these things into into powerful ideologies, what's striking in Marcuse is the the sudden association of the ecological theme here. Uh, the rape of nature with feminism. So suddenly the new myth of, um, uh, of, 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 um, uh, of uh, instinctual liberation will be both uh, the, 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 the new version in which the attack on the will to power, the will to dominate nature is formulated will be one not only of a defense of nature but also of um, uh, but also an end of the of the domination of women. Now this uh, this is present in Adorno also in the discussion uh, of anti-Semitism, in which uh, he uh, and this would be then I'm giving you another version of the way this this model of the dialectic as repression is used, the dialectic of enlightenment as repressing its early archaic stages. Uh, one of the there's there are a number of different. Uh, accounts of anti-Semitism proposed here. One of the most, several of the ones that fit into our, um, uh, into our uh, scheme uh, are these. First of all, the historical one in which the Jews are understood to represent a regressive and archaic stage of capitalism. So that, I mean, this is banal, but not so banal maybe in the form of this, uh, of this dialectical reversal that we're talking about. So that Hitler, the Nazis, are in effect rationalizing out of existence their own prehistory. And anti-Semitism is in that sense not only something you do to other people, but also something you do to your own past. Uh, and the Jews are symbolic of this archaic stage of capitalism. The other uh, point that's made, and I'd like to read that, that section because it's very striking, is the whole notion of the rage of anti-Semitism and of the authoritarian personality prejudice in general, against what's weak. What, uh, what you want to dominate, destroy, what all your most aggressive impulses are marshaled against are not people who resist your domination, but rather people whose very nature is, uh, is weak and whose weakness exasperates you and so on. Here is the, the section. Uh, the rights of man were designed, to pro page 172, were designed to promise happiness even to those without power. Because the cheated masses feel that this promise in general remains a lie as long as there are still classes, their anger is aroused. They feel mocked. They must suppress the very possibility and idea of that happiness, the more relevant it becomes. Wherever it seems to have been achieved despite its fundamental denial, they have to repeat the suppression of their own longing. Their Therefore, their aggressive impulse is a reenactment of, uh, of their own inner repression. Everything which gives occasion for such repetition, however unhappy it may be in itself, a hasver or mignon, alien things which are reminders of the promised land, or beauty which recalls sex, or the prescribed animal which is reminiscent of promiscuity and thus the archaic realm of gratification, Everything like that draws upon itself that destructive lust of civilized men who could never fulfill the, the process of civilization. Those who spasmodically dominate nature see in a tormented nature a provocative image of powerless happiness. The thought of happiness without power 
is unbearable because it would then be true happiness. So the very image that's repressed in sexism, uh, in anti-Semitism, in all the other things one can imagine, is itself a, 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 a utopian image. It's an image of a, both of an archaic form of life and of, a form, and of a form of life which would not be that of power, but which would be something else. But the only way that it can be imagined is by this exasperation, uh, which is doubly painful because uh, it shows that it doesn't exist. And so, so you have a scapegoating process whereby the very occasion for this, um, for this utopian image is, um, is itself destroyed. Now, I wanted to say a word about, uh, I think we'll reserve the, the matter of the subject for, um, for uh, later on. Uh, I wanted to say a word about, um, very brief word about dialectical thought and another word about the ideological limits of the Frankfurt School. I think I probably said that the other day too. That is, it seems to me that one's ultimate limits are always programmed by one's starting point. And, it's, and however rich and, and fascinating and suggestive this is, uh, it seems to me that ultimately uh, it does become really an ecological politics. Uh, and uh, the reason it does uh, is because uh, it's, uh, all of that is implicit in, this, in the initial choice of powerlessness as the source of history. Uh, and so uh, I think an, a, a, a genuine ideological critique of the Frankfurt School ought to be made uh, in that area and not merely on their, their political positions, although it's clear that uh, uh, Adorno and the, and, the, and, and the students were very, very much uh, at odds and his, his whole political stance is very different from, from that of Marcuse over here. But, um, uh, but it seems to me those are themselves, those, those later political stances or later political positions in very precise historical situations, those are only symptoms of, uh, of much more basic limits which are already pro programmed into this work from the starting point which sets up a notion of powerlessness and power, a dialectic of, of powerlessness and power uh, rather than, and thus, a, a whole dialectic of control which locks, uh, which locks the Frankfurt School into itself rather than some other uh, uh, starting point uh, altogether. And I think that's why this ends up being, ultimately being a political reflection about power rather than uh, one uh, uh, which would express itself in terms of modes of production, uh, what's loosely called economics or class or whatever. And so it's in that sense that Yes, uh, they're dialectical and they're Marxist, probably more Hegelian than Marxist, but uh, no, they really are neo-Marxist and non-Marxist and so on. It's a, they're, 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 uh, their work is, is very ambiguous in that, ambivalent in that sense, and I think that's one of the sources of it. The other thing I want to say, there's not much time to make a defense of the, of the dialectic, but it seems to me that um, uh, uh, it's uh, that clearly uh, this is one of the, for us, these texts are one of the great uh, places in which, once again, one can learn what dialectical thinking is like and feels like. And so whatever their other uh, weaknesses, that's a, that's a very precious and a very important uh, kind, of, um, uh, kind of thing uh, in, uh, for us in a, in a period where the, the classical dialectical texts, Hegel, for example, are very distant and, and uh, unfamiliar and couched in all kinds of... Uh, things that are alien to us. And this, however, still speaks to us about our, ourselves. Uh, uh, what I think should be said, though, um, and I say this in anticipation of the kinds of very violent attacks on the dialectic, on the negative, on the utopian, that we'll find again in Derrida in one way, but especially in, in the Deleuze, which is the most powerful uh, the, really the most powerful version of a, uh, the most powerful attack on dialectical thought, on the use of categories like lack, the negative, and so forth. What I think has to be said uh, uh, positively, lots of things have to be said, but what I want, would like to leave you with at this point is this notion that, um, uh, that dialectical thought uh, is somehow itself prospective. That uh, we're uh, that is that if it's so one of the one of the quotes from Sartre that especially that the Nouveau Philosophe today like uh, to trot out uh, with the most indignation well there are two of them one is that um, every uh, 
post-Marxist idea really turns out to be a pre-Marxist one. And then the, 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 the other sort of culminating formulation, which is that uh, le Marxisme est la seule philosophie indépassable de notre temps, that Marxism is the, the, the non-transcendable philosophy of our time. Well, uh, it w then uh, we've seen already a number of people look back and show us that Marx was a 19th century thinker and so forth, didn't have linguistic uh, training and all the rest of it. I think it's important uh, if, if uh, Sartre's uh, idea that, um, uh, that philosophies reflect group practice is so, uh, it seems to me that it's possible to suggest that uh, dialectical thinking itself doesn't yet exist. And that what we have in Hegel is really only an anticipation of, uh, of a dialectical uh, view of the world and philosophy, which couldn't possibly come into being fully developed in Hegel's time because there wasn't uh, the so there weren't the social preconditions uh, for it. What we have in Marx is a moment in which uh, the dialectical character of reality revealed itself, uh, and then uh, in an increasing process of reification in the development of consumer society, the uh, the French like the word occultation the. The, 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 the disappearance from visibility again of that, uh, of that vision, so that it seems to me uh, that it might at least be interesting to entertain the possibility, uh, a different kind of utopianism from that of, of, uh, of, of Adorno here, that, uh, that dialectical thinking is itself a thinking of the future. Which, uh, which we can only anticipate in a fitful way because there aren't yet uh, the preconditions of it and because it's the thought of a world that doesn't yet exist. Okay, uh, tomorrow morning then, I think, I don't know if we have time for questions or final reflections, denunciations. Um, uh, tomorrow we'll try to deal uh, with uh, Lord Jim then. <laughs>